The purpose of this video is to introduce you for the material for Chapter 8, Transcription and Translation. In this video, we'll look at the historical basis for the gene-protein relationship and we'll review RNA and protein structure. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the experiments that helped us to understand the connection between genes and proteins, and you should be able to describe the structure of proteins and RNA at the molecular level. So first, I'd like to review the central dogma of molecular biology. As you remember, the central dogma is that DNA serves as a template to make RNA, which is then used to make proteins. And this leads us to the analysis of three processes. First, replication, which we talked about in the last chapter. In replication, DNA is used as a template to make an identical copy of itself. So DNA is used to make DNA. But in, the, in this chapter, we're going to look at two additional processes. First, transcription, in which DNA is used as a template to make RNA. And second, translation, in which RNA is used to make protein. But one of the central questions associated with the central dogma is how do we get from DNA to protein? Well, in the past, scientists didn't know that DNA and proteins were linked. So that's, this brings us to the question, how did scientists discover the relationship between genes and proteins? They knew that heredity was associated with genes, and they also knew that genes were a part of the DNA. However, there are a series of experiments that help these scientists to connect genes to proteins. So first, Archibald Garrett was a scientist in the early 1900s who was studying inborn errors of metabolism. These are diseases that people are born with due to, due to genetic mutations in metabolic pathways. And he specifically studied an inborn error of metabolism called alcaptonuria. Alcaptonuria is a defect in the breakdown of tyrosine and a byproduct of this pathway called homogentisic acid accumulates and is excreted which causes the urine to turn black when exposed to air just as you see here. So this is the urine from a patient with alcaptonuria. Now he hypothesized that people with alcaptonuria lacked the enzyme that broke down homogentisic acid. Later, researchers found that a mutation in the gene associated with alcaptonuria actually causes the enzyme to be absent. So this provided a link between a known inherited mutation, so a link between heredity and a disease in which an enzyme was missing. A second scientist, James Sumner, who won the Nobel Prize in 1946, he um, contributed to this um, area of knowledge by purifying the first enzyme, urease, and he showed that this enzyme was in fact a protein. So he was able to crystallize this enzyme urease, which is an enzyme that breaks down urea into carbon dioxide and ammonia, and this demonstrated that enzymes were in fact proteins. So now we know that diseases that are heritable are due to malfunctioning enzymes, and then we know that enzymes are in fact proteins. In the 1940s, two scientists, Beadle and Tatum, were able to put these ideas together, and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology in 1958 for their work, which connected genes to enzymes. So Beadle and Tatum used a mold called Neurospora crassa, and this mold is a haploid mold, so there are no dominant or recessive mutations because there's only one copy of each gene in the genome. They, explored, they exposed spores of this mold to x-rays or UV radiation, which was known to induce mutations in the DNA. They then tested to see whether these mutant strains of Neurospora could grow on minimal media lacking specific newtons nutrients, and they found that they had to add back a specific nutrient for each strain. So as you can see here, they isolated several different classes of Neurospora mutants. So the wild type or normal strain could grow on media containing containing no additional nutrients. It also could grow on media containing the nutrient ornithine, citrulline, or arginine. 
However, we had class 1 mutants that could not grow on minimal media, but if you added back these nutrients, they could grow on all three. Class 2 mutants could only grow if you added back citrulline or arginine, whereas class 3 mutants could only grow if you added arginine. So they further analyzed these mutants, and they were able to organize these mutants into a pathway. So gene A converts some precursor into ornithine. Gene B encodes an enzyme that converts ornithine to citrulline. And gene C encodes an enzyme that converts citrulline to arginine. Therefore, class 1 mutants have a mutation in gene A. So if you add back ornithine, citrulline, then they can make arginine. So they were able to grow under these conditions. Class 2 mutants had a mutation in the gene encoding enzyme B. So if you added back citrulline or arginine, they were able to grow, whereas class 3 mutants had a mutation in the gene encoding enzyme C, so it, it, they were required to add back arginine in order for the neurospora to grow. This led to the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, in which one gene encoded a specific enzyme in this pathway. Now we know that this one gene, one enzyme hypothesis isn't exactly the case, but we'll talk about those exceptions in class. Now we then extended this result to human cells through the work of Linus Pauling and Vernon Ingram. In the 1940s and 1950s, together they showed that a mutation in a single gene causes sickle cell anemia. First, Linus Pauling in the 1940s found that a mutation in a single gene alters the structure of hemoglobin to cause sickle cell anemia, whereas Vernon Ingram extended this work to find that a mutation of a single base in hemoglobin produces a protein with a single difference. So here you can see an example of that. In wild-type hemoglobin, we have a CTT sequence, which leads to a GAA in the RNA, which leads to normal hemoglobin, which has a glutamic acid. However, if we mutate this T to an A, this causes a change in the mRNA, which changes an A to a U, and this leads to a valine being present, excuse me, to a valine being present in the hemoglobin molecule. So this showed that the gene protein connection actually applied to human disease. So you're going to, um, so this led to the central dogma, which sa says that DNA leads to RNA, leads to protein. The process of transcription is where DNA is used as a template to make RNA, and the process of translation is where RNA is used as a template to make protein. So we're going to talk about these two processes in class. So to get you ready for that, first we need to review the structure of RNA and the structure of proteins. So as you remember, RNA is a nucleic acid, like DNA, but there are several differences. So first, RNA contains U instead of T. Second, at the 2' prime carbon, RNA has a hydroxyl group, whereas DNA has a hydrogen group. So RNA contains the 5-carbon sugar ribose, whereas DNA contains the 5-carbon sugar deoxyribose. RNA is also a single-stranded molecule as opposed to the double-stranded DNA molecule. However, like DNA, RNA is composed of a string of nucleotides, and it has a direction. We have a 5-prime phosphate and a 3-prime. This should be a hydroxyl group. Here we have the chain extended. But RNA has direction, much like DNA. So the structures of the nucleotides are very similar with those exceptions. And then if we go on to look at protein structure, so as you remember, proteins are made of amino acids, which have a central carbon atom, an amino functional group, and a carboxyl functional group, and then an R group, which gives that amino acid its characteristics. 
Amino acids come together via dehydration synthesis reactions in which a molecule of water is released to form a peptide bond. So you may want to review the higher order of protein structure as well to get ready for this chapter. And that's the end of this video.